o'clock news. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Russ Riesinger. As Montana approaches the milestone of 100,000 COVID-19 vaccinations, state leaders are asking the federal government for more vaccines. Montana is set to get more than 15,000 more first doses next week. During a news conference today, Governor Greg Gianforte said the state has the capacity to administer twice that amount. He said Montana is one of the top states when it comes to administering the vaccine it gets, but among the bottom states when it comes to the number of doses received per capita. Population. We're doing a terrific job as the CDC data show, but we're not being rewarded with an appropriate dose allocation from the federal government. Well, the state's numbers do not include people who've been vaccinated through federal programs. Leaders say several thousand more Montanans have received doses through the Indian Health Service and the VA. The number of Montanans now in the hospital with COVID-19 has dropped to only about 100. And so far, state health authorities have not reported any more deaths today. And tonight, active cases are right around 3,600. Nearly 89,000 Montanans have recovered from the virus. And once the next shipment of vaccine rolls into billing, St. Vincent Healthcare will be ready. The hospital has come up with a new way to sign up to get the COVID-19 vaccine. You can now add your name to a list by filling out a form on the SCL Health website. That form asks for basic information such as your age, address, and previous medical conditions. The hospital says it should take about two minutes to complete. One noted feature on the form is that people are able to indicate if they want to be added to the rapid call list as in case someone ahead of them is unable to make their appointment. There's one additional data element that we have on the form and that's for individuals who could potentially break away with very little notice because we've had a no-show or for whatever reason we have an extra appointment on that given day. So we ask individuals to indicate whether or not that's an option for them because our commitment is to vaccinate as many people as quickly as we can and not waste a single dose of vaccine. So that's also part of what you'll see on that form. Now, Skihan notes people who do not have online access and are currently eligible to receive the vaccine can call 406-237-7050 to schedule an appointment. Tonight, more Montanans tied to the Capitol riots three weeks ago. Two Montana brothers caught on camera at one of the most visible confrontations with authorities inside the Capitol. As of tonight, more than 170 people have been arrested, three of those from Montana. MTN's John Riley tells us about the latest two. Court documents say Helena area brothers Joshua Calvin Hughes and Jared Wade Hughes turned themselves into Helena police after seeing national news coverage from the Helena Capitol and believing they were wanted by the FBI. Joshua and Jared Hughes each faced nine charges for their alleged involvement in the riot. Prosecutors say the brothers were among the first 10 rioters to enter the U.S. Capitol at that part of the building. Jared Hughes is accused of working with another man to kick open a door that would let more people enter the building. From there, court records say the crowd began to move towards the Senate floor. According to investigators, the two met up with another suspect, Douglas Austin Jensen, who had engaged with a lone Capitol Police officer, Eugene Goodman. Images of surveillance video show the mob advancing up a flight of stairs towards Goodman. Goodman has been called a hero for baiting the rioters away from the Senate floor while lawmakers were still evacuating. Goodman led the crowd to an adjacent hallway and backup, where the confrontation continued until rioters left the atrium. Investigators say the Hughes brothers were among a group who then forced their way onto the Senate floor, where video captured the two men opening senators' desks and reviewing sensitive material inside. The Hughes brothers are two of three Montanans now that have had charges filed against them regarding the Capitol riots. The other was a Dillon man who was arrested and released last week. Reporting in Helena, John Riley, MTN News. Among the charges listed in court documents, obstructing law enforcement during a civil disorder, entering the Capitol with the intent to disrupt official business and destruction of property. Now Capitol Police are stepping up security over concerns for lawmakers' safety following that assault on the Capitol. Some Democrats say threats are also coming internally from their Republican colleagues across the aisle. Skylar Henry reports from Washington. 
Capitol Police are ramping up security at D.C. area transportation hubs to improve travel safety for lawmakers. That you take CBS News has learned the acting House Sergeant at Arms created an online portal for members to share their travel plans and help make law enforcement aware of their movements. The acting chief of police also wants permanent fencing around the Capitol complex and backup forces ready nearby. Protecting the Capitol is a matter of protecting our democracy. Thursday, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi met with the retired general she asked to lead a security review. She told reporters some members are concerned about violence from their own colleagues. The enemy is within the House of Representatives. President Democrats are calling newly elected Georgia Republican and QAnon supporter Marjorie Taylor Greene dangerous. They're trying to expel me from Congress. Green got a standing ovation at a town hall meeting Thursday evening as she rejected calls for expulsion after she endorsed violence against Democratic leaders on social media. Missouri Congresswoman Cori Bush tweeted she's moving her office away from Greens for safety. Others are also concerned. Calling for violence and condoning violence and exciting violence towards members that you do not agree with is just wrong, and I do not feel safe around this representative. Congresswoman Johanna Hayes represents Newtown, Connecticut, the site of the 2012 Sandy Hook massacre. She has urged GOP leaders to remove Green from the House Committee on Education and Labor, proclaiming that the Newtown school mass shooting was staged. Skyler Henry, CBS News, Washington. Now, the FBI says two pipe bombs left at the offices of the Republican and Democratic National Committees just blocks from the Capitol had actually been placed the night before the attack on the complex, and it's not clear yet if those pipe bombs are connected to the January 6th riot. A fugitive wanted for questioning in a Billings murder is captured in Chicago. In December, two federal warrants were issued for 28-year-old Lorenzo James Harris. He's accused of assault with a weapons charge and strangulation. But police say he's also a person of interest in a murder investigation here in Billings. A fugitive task force tracked him down, arrested him in Chicago yesterday. Authorities are not addressing which murder they want to question him about. Harris is pending extradition back to Montana. Well, the Montana House on Friday endorsed a bill that would prohibit local governments from putting additional requirements on vaping shops and products. That bill is sponsored by Republican Representative Ron Marshall of Hamilton, who co-owns three vape shops in the state. The House endorsed that bill on a 65 to 35 vote with all but two House Republicans in favor. All 33 Democrats opposed it. Local governments like to go around and say that these products are tobacco products and that we can't sell them. A legal product in the United States and we can't sell it. Even though we're licensed through the state, we pay taxes, we have employees, we're small businesses. Mar find a final binding vote is expected next week. Marshall said the bill is about small business owners limiting controls by local governments when the businesses already have to comply with state regulations. All right, turning to Chief Meteorologist Ed McIntosh. Ed's been a well since uh, snow has impacted uh, uh, travel the way we're expecting it might, uh, might uh, tonight. Huh? That's right. We're already seeing a good portion of the state being affected by some of that. You can see that with Doppler radar. And it's basically on that band from around Butte all the way up towards the Fort Peck region now starting to move into south central and southeastern Montana as well. A lot of the travel concerns so far have been in areas of central Montana and we're going to see that shift more and more towards us during the overnight hours. Around Geyser, this is in between Billings and the Great Falls area. Hayes just a little bit to the north there. You can see some of that snow that continues to fly around. Judith Gap getting a little closer to the Billings area. Very poor visibility where we grabbed that picture a few minutes ago and also under the Marnock Canyon. We start looking south of uh, the Great Falls area, they've already got four plus inches of snow there. We'll come back, take a look at how this round of snow will affect us and the bigger chance of snow and colder temperatures next week. Details in a few minutes. Thanks, Ed. The Billings Symphony Orchestra and Choral celebrating a big day today. We're The ribbon cutting marked a new era for its headquarters, sales and community outreach. To help celebrate the event, a German Dusseldorfer piano is on loan in the symphony's lobby. It's a piece they hope to permanently showcase. For the first time, the entire library is in one place, and there's a meeting room that symphony administrators say the public can eventually use. And one big addition to the new location is the symphony's new artistic office. 
can record some of our Explore Music activities where we can have uh, guest artists practice. Uh, we've used it for a number of different recordings to uh, musician auditions, uh, you name it, we can, we can do that kind of thing in the artistic office. But we are very excited to announce today that from February 13th we'll come back to perform with symphonic music for our community and we have several concerts over a weekend so we can socially distance and everybody must can just making sure we, we provide a safe event. We can't wait. That's, uh, you heard him right. Shows are live shows once again on the way. The new building also offers the convenience of ground level ticket purchases. We're still ahead on tonight's MT and 10 o'clock news here on Q2. Keeping a charge, Montana State University researchers helping lead the way in an effort to improve the lifespan of a product we use every day. That story coming up next. And a little later in sports, the battle of the unbeatens, the Lady Rams of Central and the Lady Bulldogs of Hardin facing off on the hardwood. We've got highlights from games all over the area coming up. From Montana's news leader, you're watching the MTN 10 o'clock news. Whether it's for laptops and electric cars or technology used by soldiers heading towards conflict, more and more we're finding ourselves relying on batteries. But unfortunately, they only last so long. MTN's Cody Boyer shows us how with the help of a nationwide team, Montana State University researchers are making new battery advancements. We all use batteries, including lithium-ion batteries, more than we think we do these days. With all the portable electronics out there, even us as reporters use them for our cameras. So we can tell you it's very inconvenient when the batteries decide to... Case in point, die. So the research study at MSU they're looking to fix that. I've had my job for 25 years. I got the greatest job in the world. To Rob Walker, chemistry and biochemistry professor at MSU, it's a project that's end goal could change the power storage game for many. It leverages you know, decades, collectively decades of experience studying energy conversion processes formerly in fuel cells and now applying it to new and e uh, emerging technologies. It's all a part of a $10 million effort nationwide, including labs and universities across the country. $3.5 million of that, all from the Army Research Lab, came to MSU. We're making discoveries that no one has ever made before. We are discovering new materials. We are learning new chemistries. So that sense of discovery can't be beat. These are batteries that have very high power densities, need to be able to operate in a whole host of conditions, including very cold and very hot. Lee Spangler, director of the Energy Research Institute at MSU, says that includes helping soldiers who, on average, carry 10 pounds of batteries at a time and don't have many options to charge them on the move. Not to mention if damaged, lithium ion batteries can catch fire. We're doing everything from the material science that actually changes the materials of the batteries are made out of clear up to how they operate in circuits. Walker adds all of these improvements are important in a world less and less plugged into walls. The capabilities, the expertise is second to none. It, it is what you will find at any internationally recognized center of excellence. It's, it's here. At the Chemistry and Biochemistry Building on MSU, Cody Boyer, MTN News. Thanks, Cody. Up next in weather, we all knew winter would return. It was only a matter of when. Ed will answer that question with his full seven-day forecast coming up after the break. Storm Tracker weather starts now with meteorologist Ed McIntosh. Welcome back. 44 was the high temperature today. We were in a little bit warmer than average, both for the daytime high and the overnight low. Sunset uh, now at 516 in the evening. And while we didn't add any precipitation today, Chances are we could pick up at least a little bit overnight tonight heading into tomorrow. This evening as we take a look with the Stockman Bank weather cam at 34 degrees, just a little bit of a north breeze. The colder air is starting to sink down across the region and it's bringing this band of snow. Now it's moved out of the Great Falls area, but you can see this big area from Homestake Pass up to around Harleton, Judith Gap. You're going to start to see some of that increase a bit for you up towards Malta, Glasgow into the Fort Peck region. And a few showers are trying to make it into southeastern Montana, although some of what we're seeing here on uh, Doppler radar not quite making the ground yet. Occasionally where you see these little uh, pink flickers, we do have the potential for some slicker conditions in those areas as well. 
especially here through the early evening hours. So here's the setup for us. Still have that winter weather advisory into effect for southwest Montana, but also adding in these areas from around Terry up towards Glendive, where we could have some problems with some uh, light snow, maybe some slick roads first thing in the morning, and then fog, a real possibility as we look off into north and south Dakota, especially through tomorrow morning. So here comes the band of snow showers moving across the area. Temperatures behind the front, we're only in the teens from around Haber over towards Cut Bank, even colder once we start looking along uh, areas north of the Missouri River, 20s in northeastern Montana, and then as we look into southern Montana and northern Wyoming, a lot more 30s into the mix here as of this hour. Really not that far off for where an afternoon high would be. So the band of snow showers will move across the area, producing the potential for snow overnight through first thing tomorrow morning. That system will sink through southeastern Montana, and then we'll start to clear the sky out a bit in the afternoon. Temperatures are back up 30s and 40s for the highs tomorrow, so at or warmer than average. As we take it into Sunday, We'll look at warming along with some wind in the mountain foothills and also up around the Rocky Mountain front. That's going to help to boost the temperatures up a bit on Sunday. The warmest temperatures will come on Monday and Tuesday. Monday, as that ridge really starts to build in, we hang on to some of that wind. Tuesday, watch the showers start to develop in western Montana. Ahead of the front, we could still make as warm as the low 50s for the daytime highs. But watch this trough just sink across the area. That'll bring the first round of snow showers in Tuesday night heading into Wednesday and a big drop in the temperatures. Thursday is a little bit quieter, get a little break. And then on Friday, the current timing would bring in a second round of snow showers and reinforce that colder air and keep it around for a while. So tonight we'll be looking for temperatures to sink down mainly into the teens and 20s. Band of snow showers moves across. Potential for some slick conditions, especially here in eastern Montana. We could see some light snow in the Billings area through tomorrow morning. It doesn't look like it would add up to much. And then start to clear out during the afternoon. We'll be looking for temperatures to recover to 30s and 40s by the end of the day tomorrow. And as far as the total amount of snowfall, we'll be looking at light accumulations. Areas could see an inch or two, but for the most part, we're looking at an, an inch or less. Temperatures around Billings will warm up upper 30s to low 40s tomorrow, and then we'll continue to build in the warming temperatures with drier conditions Monday, Tuesday, it's Tuesday night into Wednesday when we start to see the drop of the temperatures and we start to bring in that potential for snow. That does it for weather. All right, thank you, Ed. Straight ahead on the M10 10 o'clock news here on Q2, a new study showing Yellowstone National Park one of the most dangerous. I'm going to dive into those numbers and show you what they really mean after the break. New reports show the danger of dying at our national parks and Yellowstone National Park ranks high on that list. But as MTN's John Shear reports, those numbers may not mean what you think they do. Now, just a quick look at the statistics might have you thinking that the famous Yellowstone Arch here is a doorway to death. After all, Yellowstone ranks fifth on the list of parks where the most people have died in the last 10 years. It's right up there with other popular parks. Grand Canyon, Yosemite, Smoky Mountains, Sequoia, and Kings Canyon. But that phrase, other popular parks, is key. This list includes some of the most popular parks in the country. So, of course, the number of deaths is higher because more people visited these parks. A personal injury law firm with offices in Nevada and California looked at the data in a different way. It calculated the number of deaths per 10 million park visits over that 10-year period. Now, that yields a dramatically different list. None of the parks on the top five list even appear in the top 10 when you ask not whether people died, but the likelihood of dying. Here's a map that shows the difference. The bigger the bubble, the higher the likelihood of death at a park. Notice the small bubble for Yellowstone? It works out to about 12 deaths per capita. It's about the same at Glacier at 13. Grand Teton is more at 15. But our nearby parks are hardly a blip compared to the most dangerous park. That's the rugged, cliff-filled North Cascades in Washington at 652 deaths. Even Mount Rainier is higher than Montana parks at 38 deaths. So what is killing people at our national parks? You might think falling because a lot of the parks have some pretty spectacular and steep scenery. 
The top two killers are among the top causes of deaths anywhere in the country. Those would be drowning and vehicle crashes. Undetermined causes, and here it finally appears, falls come next, followed by natural death. That's usually medically related. But what about the dangerous thermal features here in Yellowstone? After all, we hear about accidents around those nearly every year. Well, that's true, but the numbers are so low that it doesn't even show up in the lists. The same for bear attacks. It happens, but it's very rare. Now, here at park headquarters, rangers tell me that that doesn't mean you should throw all caution to the wind, but it also doesn't mean you should flee in terror. In Yellowstone National Park, John Shearer, MTN News. Thanks, John. We'll be back with an action-packed sports night after the break. Busy night on the high school hardwood tonight. Q2 Sports Director Scott Breen tips off the highlights from Billings Senior. Hi everybody and welcome to the weekend. Scott Breen over at Billings Senior with the Bronx Mounts in tonight. Perfect at home this early season. Bozeman entering though, five and one. Let's see what gives in this one between the Bronx and Hawks. First half, Hawks get right to work. Brady Lang driving. Let everybody with 17 points tonight. Bozeman up 11 to three. Tucker McBeth then penetrates. Gets the roll and just like that, Hawks up 17-5 in Senior's gym. Bronx answer with a 9-2 run off the steal. Liam Romay in transition, lefty layup. Then it's Junior Bergen knifing to the free throw line. Jump shot good. Senior still trailing 35-27 at half. Third quarter, Hawks open it back up. Trent Rogers deep. Got it. Bozeman lead back to 13. Final seconds of the third quarter, Bryson Zanto right into the teeth of Senior's defense for a 50-37 lead. Zanto had 13 points. Senior makes it interesting in the final minute. Bubba Bergen, nice feed to Taylor Ronish. And then Romay, look at the distance on this shot. Banks in for the NBA three. Bronx would cut it to five, but that's the difference. Senior's first home court loss of the season. A solid Hawks team, now six and one, wins at 63-58. Scott Breen, MTN Sports. All right, thanks, Scott. At First Interstate Arena, a battle of the unbeatens in Class A between the Central Lady Rams and the Hard Lady Bulldogs. This was a close game. We pick it up in the fourth quarter, hardened down by two, but they make something happen here. That was Kylie Oldalk knocking it down for three. Then here comes Harden again. This time it's Camber Goodluck heading the play, decides to take it herself. She finishes it, gets the bucket to fall. However, Central takes command late in this one. Soleil Ellison pump fakes, dishes it out to Maria Stewart. She knocks down the three-pointer. And Central, watch him there with the rebound and uh, full court push here on this one. This time it's Ellison again taking the lead. Nice lay-in, gets it to go. And Central goes on to win it 54-50 to to remain perfect on the season. All right, boys took the court right after that. First half action here. Harden coming out with the ball. And uh, that's Jalen Highhawk dishing it out to Brian Bryson Rogers beyond the arc. That was a three. And uh, here comes the Central Rams, though, pushing it up the court. Long pass, layup, they get it. And the one uh, as well to go with it with the foul. And then Central back at it, working it around the arc here. Logan Hill, wide open, top, drains it for three. And Central goes on to get the win. And this one easy tonight, crushing hard in 74. 44 the final on that one. Now we travel to Red Lodge where the Rams welcomed in the Red Devils of Huntley Project tonight. Here's Alec Boffinger with the highlights. Hello everybody and welcome inside Red Lodge High School. We've got some District 4B basketball on hand tonight as the Huntley Project boys and girls come to town. We'll start it off with the boys as Red Lodge and Huntley Project are the top two teams in the conference. Projects Noah Bouchard hot early on. Step back jumper finds nothing but the bottom of the net. Now Bouchard out in transition, and he is awful tough to slow down on the break. Euro steps for two more. Red Lodge was strong tonight. Trey Allen gets to the rack and finishes through a bit of contact. And then Allen is going to whip the pass cross court to beat the zone as Tyler Schro catches and finishes in one motion, and Red Lodge is up eight at halftime. But here come the Red Devils in the second half. Bouchard breaking out the Dirk one-legged fadeaway and gets the sweet roll. Bouchard was in his bag tonight. Behind the back, spins back to his left and drops in the floater in the lane and Project leads. Red Lodge has an answer. Jay Jetmore to Allen on the break and he gets the bucket to put the Rams ahead. 
Now Project down one with time winding down. Bouchard gets to the basket, another spin move, and muscles through the contact for the bucket with 1.8 seconds left as the Red Devils keep their unbeaten conference record intact, 53-52. Rams trying to avoid the sweep in the nightcap. Project would hang around early though. Brooke McClenning catches and fires from the middle of the key and it goes. But Red Lodge had too much in the tank tonight. Brooklyn Allen with the turnaround jumper down low. And then Allen going to work again in the post. Another tough little jumper as Red Lodge cruises past Project for the win. We'll have more with Bouchard on his game winner at MontanaSports.com. For MTN Sports, I'm Alec Boffinger. Thanks, Alec. And as always, you can catch all the scores and highlights from around the state at montanasports.com. Now we want to send it back on over to Ed McIntosh for a final look at the weather. Ed? Temperatures likely uh, into the 20s overnight. We'll see some areas of snow showers, and tomorrow we'll start to clear out by the mm -hmm. time we start getting later on into the afternoon. Temperatures into the 40s, then 50s into the early part of the week and we'll be looking for the chance of showers to move in, especially by the time we start looking into Wednesday and Thursday, a pretty significant drop in the temperatures. Then we'll look for the temperatures to level off into the 40s and, or rather the 30s and 20s as we start getting towards the end of next week. And the overnight temperatures also start to sink down. So the overall trend is going to be once we hit that colder weather, we're going to stay colder for a while and the frequency of the snow showers will start to increase along with it. Make sure you leave yourself a little extra time tomorrow morning. We could have some slick spots to get the day started and then uh, start to dry out later in the afternoon. But that second round of cold and snow, that one means a little more business for us as we start getting into the middle of next week. Yeah, been a long time since we've had any snow on the ground here in Billings. It's